Now, <clears throat> my first guest I would like to present to you is the Wendy Diaz. And Wendy Diaz was born in Puerto Rico, embraced Islam in the year 2000. She is the director of Adla Moses Islam, a nonprofit outreach program dedicated to creating educational resources about Islam in Spanish language. She is a writer and translator for Ikna and Y Islam. She graduated with honors from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, with a degree in modern languages and linguistics, specializing in education and also studied Arabic in Egypt and in the Islamic Learning Foundation in New York and Islamic sciences through, all, uh, through the Al Maghrib Institute, Miska University, Tuba University, and Ikna Sister Wing. She has authored and illustrated seven bilingual Islamic chapters. Welcome, Wendy Diaz. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Jazakumullahu khairan. Thank you for having me. I am so excited and thrilled um, and honored to be here among all of the distinguished guests. And alhamdulillah, my topic today is the Latino community is waiting on Muslims. And I think it is a timely topic given that we are in the midst of Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, it goes from September 15th to October 15th. Uh, and it has been in observance in the US since uh, 1989. And the reason for the Hispanic Heritage Month is to honor the culture and contributions of Hispanic and Latin Americans here in the, U in the United States. And I also wanted to bring up what other culture is rooted in Latin America that we know about. Um, what has, what other heritage has shaped our culture as Latin Americans, our languages, our, our way of life, our traditions? And if you don't know the answer to that, then I want you to listen close. What if I propose to you that Hispanic Heritage Month is also Islamic Heritage Month? Would you understand why? Let's talk about, a lot of us already know uh, a lot about the glorious days of our past, of Islamic Spain, of the uh, Islamic civilizations in West Africa, and all the huge impact that those have had on the, the establishment and the, uh, the construction of the United States, and also Latin America, Central America, South America, the Caribbean, what impact it had the Islamic civilizations, Islamic Spain and the Muslims of Africa have had on our culture. So that is why I say that Hispanic Heritage Month is also Islamic Heritage Month. I want, to, I want us to think about this uh, Islamic Spain, we hear about this and we some of us have had the privilege of going to visit Spain and see the structures that are there, the remnants that are left behind from our ancestors. And we're proud to see that some of us have taken classes about Islamic Spain, um, about the, the Muslims in Mali, about the Muslim empires in West Africa, in Africa, in North Africa. And I want you to think about the presence of Muslims in Spain was something that began as early as only se about 70, 71 years after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you imagine that there may have been companions that were still alive during the time that Muslims began entering and conquering Spain. There were tabi'in that were alive during that time. These Muslims established themselves in Spain for 800 years. Think about that. From 710 until 1492. Imagine 800 years of rule, 
If you wanna really put that into context, think about the United States of America. How long has the United States existed as a nation? It's only been around for 244 years, not even 300 years, okay? So to just speak about Islamic Spain as an era of just a little bit of influence, you know, we have these buildings left behind, we have the architecture, the arts and all of these things, but look beyond that. Can we really think that the culture that was embedded in, in Spain, in these people, can we really think that it was just done away with like this? That in 1492, when the last Muslims were expelled from Spain, that all of a sudden our culture disappeared? Where did the Muslims go? A lot of the Muslims that were expelled from Spain, they were, first of all, a lot of them were tortured. Some of them were forced to convert to Christianity. Some of them uh, were displaced. They were asked, they were expelled from their homes after generations. Imagine, generations. They were told to go back to where you came from, but guess what? Where they had come from, that was, only, that was 800 years ago that they came. So where did they go? A lot of them, they went to North Africa. A lot of them went to different places. And many of them also came to the new world, the Americas. That includes the US now, that includes the Caribbean, that includes South America, Central America, Mexico, etc. So what we find is that Latin Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, we are descendants of those Islamic civilizations. Not to mention when the slave trade began and there were Muslim captives that were brought from Africa to the Americas to help establish and colonize these countries or what, what is now known as the countries of Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, Ecuador, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, all of these countries were helped, they were established, uh, Muslims helped to establish these countries. A lot of the descendants of Muslims were there establishing these countries. Where did these descendants go? Where did they go? Did they just disappear? No. Latin Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, we are living relics of those ancient Islamic civilizations. So now are we doing our part to introduce these people to Islam? Are we doing enough to reach out to the Latino community or are we too busy othering Latinos? Are we too busy alienating Latinos? Do we think that they're not good enough for our dawah? Even though Latin American countries have been receiving immigrants from Muslim majority countries, even before, after the time of Islamic Spain, until now, with the dismantlement of the Ottoman Empire, came a mass migration that continues to this day of Muslims coming from the Middle East, countries that were nations, lands that used to belong to the Ottoman Empire. They migrated to Latin America and there they were received with open arms. I want you to do some homework if you're listening to me out there. Go to Google uh, and look up how many presidents political figures of Muslim descent there were or there have been in Latin America. Can you imagine that in Latin America, Muslims have been able to even hold the highest political positions, more than what they've been able to do here in the United States. So what is the point of this? I want us to realize <coughs> that a group of people that deserve more than, maybe more than anyone, our dawah, our calling, our education to teach them about Islam. And if we wanna go ahead and ignore all of our glorious past 
that we share, Latinos and Muslims, we have a shared past. But if we want to ignore that, at least remember the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, where he said, and certainly we sent into every nation a messenger to teach the people worship Allah and avoid tabut. And some of them we guided, and some of them we decreed that they be misguided or they be left in error. So what does that mean? Even if we community as Muslims, we cannot ignore the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a messenger to every single nation, including the nations in Latin America. And thus, we have descendants of Muslims walking amongst us here in the United States and in Latin America who deserve that we call them back to Islam, to their roots, that we reintroduce them to what is part of their heritage, our Islamic heritage, our Hispanic heritage. I want to tell you a personal story. Um, there, there are two different extremes I find in the Muslim community. And there's a, there are two extremes and a lot of in between. But I want to tell you something personal that happened to me. When I was a teenager, I was first introduced to Islam at about age 16. And at that time, I met a Muslim family. And that family, I met them through a girl who was in one of my classes in high school. And even though I was a Hispanic girl, Latina, Puerto Rican, in her class, she still befriended me. We became really close. And through her and her family, I started asking questions because I realized that they were Muslim. And so I started asking them, why do you pray the way that you do? Why do Muslim women dress the way they do? What does this mean? What does that mean? And so I was curious and I wanted to know more about Islam and more and more and more. And they would patiently answer my questions. And they welcomed me into their home. And I loved the family, they loved me, and they showed me love and respect. Eventually, from me asking them questions, they gave me some literature to read. A copy of the Quran, a, a book about uh, Islam and Christianity, interfaith dialogue. And because of that, I was able to start reading about Islam and learning and became more and more curious. And because of that family, I eventually embraced Islam. Alhamdulillah. But let me tell you what the other extreme is. After that point in time where I started learning about Islam, I had moved away from where that family lived. And I started working in a mall. And I worked in a clothing store there. And in that clothing store, there, uh, they, you were required to dress the, the dress from whatever clothes the clothing store was selling. So I was a young teenage girl, about 18. I was dressing with the clothes that were sold in that clothing store, things that were normal for a teenage girl at that time. And I used to walk around the mall and say hello to all of the different merchants that were there that worked there as well. And there was a particular gentleman and he was Turkish and he had a, he had a stand, a, a kiosk um, where he sold electronics and anyway, one day I was having a conversation with him. I said, hello, and I was talking to him. And I said, you know, I'm learning about Islam. And he was Muslim, Muslim from Turkey. And I told him I'm learning about Islam and maybe, you know, never know. Maybe I'll become Muslim one day. I told him this, me as a teenage girl. And you know what the brother said to me? He said, you, you cannot be a Muslim. And I said, why not? And he said, look at you, Puerto Rican girl. Look at how you dress. What is this? No, you're not gonna be a Muslim. You can't be a Muslim. So, <laughs> SubhanAllah, the reason why I tell you these stories is because I want you to understand the mentality that some Muslims have. Alhamdulillah, we have some Muslims who are open and willing to dialogue with people and who have an open mind to welcome others 
and understand them and allow them to understand us. But then you have other Muslims who say, you're not good enough to learn about Islam. But subhanAllah, how can you tell someone that they're not good enough to learn about Islam? When the Prophet, some of the companions that we know about, hey, they committed some of the worst crimes. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he wanted to kill the Prophet sallallahu He was on his way to kill the Prophet sallallahu He had his sword drawn and everything. And eventually he became a Muslim. So who are we to say, no, you're not good enough? Audhu billah. So I want to invite all of us to remember that we have an obligation. We are tied to the Latino community, whether we want to admit that or not. And I want us to work together with the organizations that are out there. Alhamdulillah, here in the US, there are huge pockets of Hispanics. Hispanics are the largest growing minority in the United States. We are also the largest growing minority within Islam. And there are plenty of organizations in the areas that are heavily populated with Latinos, such as Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas, New Jersey, New York, Chicago, LA. And there are also in between that, there are plenty of other organizations and individuals who are Hispanic or Latino, Latin American Muslims who are working in the field of da'wah. And even if they're not, they are willing to help us to spread the message of Islam. We need to start working together with these people. We need to all work together and uh, support organizations like Why Islam, ICNA, uh, and other organizations that are working with the Hispanic community. And I appreciate your time. Jazakumullahu khairan. MashaAllah, Jazakumullahu khairan. It's an amazing story. And uh, I'll let you know that Los Angeles has a Why Islam chapter called Pork Islam. And uh, we also locally work with the uh, Latino Muslim, LALMA, which is another organization. So we have a, a coordination with them also. Too. Uh, my, uh, inshallah, we uh, invite our next speaker. Now, everybody knows, I think, and um, Yusha Evans probably does not need introduction. And uh, Yusha Evans is a currently travels the globe as a lecturer and caller to Islam. He has been pivotal in establishing Islamic television station in North America as well as uh, as well has appeared in many Islamic stations throughout the world. He also is a multiple discipline black belt holder and runs a full time martial art academy. I present you, Yusha Evan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah wa rahmatullahi wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. I don't have very long, so I want to be straight to the point, inshallah ta'ala, before the boat drowns. Now, when you think of before the boat drowns in terms of da'wah, you know my mind is brought to Nuh alayhi salam, or Noah, um, and the time that he lived in. And we can take a lot of lessons in our current uh, 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 world when it comes to the life of Nuh alayhi salam. Um, you know, he preached for a very long time. Very few people listened to him. He took very few people with him. Uh, his, his, you know, his own son didn't listen to him. He built the large ark, uh, you know, to try to save all of humanity. And only a very few decided to listen to his message of Tawheed. Now, before the boat drowns, and this is something that we need to learn in da'wah, and I've always considered this a prerequisite, a prerequisite of da'wah. Because when we look at the Anbiya, all of them, from, from the time of Nuh to Musa to Jesus to our Prophet Muhammad, uh, وسلم, may Allah peace and blessings be upon all of them, they all carried this prerequisite with them. And we can see it in their, in, in, in their life stories, and it is exemplified throughout the Qur'an and throughout their life stories that we are told. And you can find it in the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad And this prerequisite is that you must care. You must care about people. In order to be involved in da'wah in an effective manner or in an effective level and for it to be consistent, in order to continue upon it, in order to be doing da'wah you know, for years and years and years and years, you need to have this prerequisite of concern for human beings. Because if we look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad 
before receiving prophethood. He cared about people. He was always trying to find solutions to help his people through the, the, the evils that were in the society. He was always trying to help them overcome these evils. He used to go to the Treaty of Fudayl. He used to retire to the cave and, 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 and fast and think about you know, the problems his people, his people faced and how he could help them. And this concern allowed him to continue the message for the rest of his life with some genuine uh, uh, um, uh, intention. He even said, you know, that I'm like someone who stands on the edge of a pit of fire trying to call you away from it, holding you by the back of your collarbone, collars, but you keep throwing yourselves into it. If we look at the life of Nuh alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to build this large, massive boat. And Nuh knew what was coming. He knew that the destruction uh, um, is, is, is coming to his people. He knew this. He could have saved himself. I mean, look how long he had been preaching his message. And everyone kept turning him down and turning him down and turning him down and turning him down. It did not turn him cold. It didn't turn him against people. It didn't make him harsh. It didn't make him hard-hearted. He could have easily said, you know what? Forget about these people. I know the destruction is coming. I am going to save myself. No, he didn't. Even though he knew probably that most of these people are not going to listen to him. He knew from all of his life that the majority of these people are not going to listen to me. So I might as well just save myself. But he decided to build the boat anyway. All the effort that it took to build the ark, to build the ark of Noah. He did this out of his concern for people. First and foremost, he did it out of his obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's order. But also he had genuine concern. This is why he went out after building the boat and called people to come on it. Called people who wanted to be saved. Because he had a genuine care and concern for humanity. And their, 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 their souls. And he tried to get them to understand the message of Tawheed. So... We have now a, a situation where the world is in, in deep darkness. The world is in deep darkness and it gets deeper every single day. We, we, we witness this. We see this all around us. For any of you who are actually plugged in to the real world, you realize that the world is getting darker by the day. And we know that there will come a time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will end all of this. He will end all of this and bring this to uh, its final fruition. And we have to have as a society of Muslims, a care about the general world that is around us, a general care about the world that is around us. We have to understand that da'wah is an obligation. This is why I've, I, I, I got into it. And this is why I will stay in, 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 in da'wah in some form or fashion. For as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for me to remain guided and living and breathing and capable. Um, because it is an obligation. Allah Jalla tells us in Surah Al-Nahl, يُدْعُوا إِلَّا سَبِيرُ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَمَعْزَةُ الْحَسَنَةِ Call into the way of your Lord with wisdom and with good speech. Now, if there were no other uh, subjects of da'wah spoken about, if the Prophet hadn't told us to convey convey for me even if it's one verse, if you haven't commanded us during the farewell sermon, if there wasn't so much evidence about the station of da'wah, this one verse from Surah Al-Nahl puts it into clear perspective, its importance and its station. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins it with a general command, a general command. Grammatically, the word uh, da'wah, da'a, the root of da'wah, da'a, same as du'a. But Allah has changed it grammatically into the state of amr, a command. Ud'u, the same like when Allah says, Utu zakah, aqim as salah. These are all command words that are commanding you to perform an act of worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Da'wah, ud'u, the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his command to do it reaches these same levels. So we cannot shy from it because we will be questioned about it. Anything that is given to humanity as an order, they will be questioned about. 
anything that is an obligation you are going to be questioned about and your dereliction of duty will be held accountable and i know there are a lot of people and i've been and i've been hearing this for years and years and years now i've been you know doing this da'wah thing now for almost 15 years and i've been teaching da'wah courses for well over a decade and i always get the same type of question or uh, concern about da'wah that yes brother yusha we understand that was very important but i don't do it because i don't have time uh, i don't do it because i don't have knowledge I don't do it because I don't have this, that. There, there's something that you don't have um, that, that keeps you from doing it. And my response is always the same. A command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be avoided because of lack of time, lack of knowledge, lack of ability, lack of courage. It's the same like salah. If I were to tell you that I've been a Muslim for 21, 22 years, but I've never prayed salah, because I do not know how to pray. I don't have the knowledge of how to pray. Am I excused? No, I'm not excused. I am sinful. I am sinful. If I don't pray because I say I don't have the time to pray, am I excused? No, I am sinful. I'm absolutely sinful. If I say, you know, I'm in a public space and I, I, I don't have uh, the courage to pray in front of other people, am I excused? No, you're not excused. You are sinful. Because there is a legal ruling in Islam that anything that is an order, then everything that makes you capable of fulfilling that order is also a command. If salah is a command, then everything that you need to know in order to fulfill the obligation of salah is a command. Knowing how, number one, going all the way back to the basics, knowing the rules of tahara, of purification, is a command. Knowing the rules, the rulings of wudu is a command. Knowing the rulings of the Salah, the Arkan, the pillars of the Salah that is mandatory, is mandatory. Making time for Salah is mandatory. Having courage enough to pray Salah is mandatory. So because of the fact that this is mandatory, everything that comes along with it is mandatory. So if Da'wah is an obligation, which indeed it is, then the necessary components for you to have in order to share the message are also obligatory. And that might be different for every person. I'm not saying you need to go and become a global speaker on the da'wah scene. I'm not, I'm not even suggesting you do that. I'm not suggesting you do that. I'm not encouraging you to do that uh, whatsoever. But within your own realm, within your own world, you have to look for the opportunities of da'wah that are presented to you as well as look for ways to make opportunities and open opportunities to share the message of Islam. Um, and that can be a very simple message. The prophetic example of da'wah was very simple. Qul, la ilaha illallah tuflihun. Say that there is no deity but Allah and I will guarantee you success. So it was the focus of da'wah has always been on tawheed and that is the core of da'wah. Anything other than the call to tawheed is not da'wah. It, it may be partial da'wah or the message or delivering some nasiha, some advice, but it's not da'wah. Da'wah is ud'u illa sabiri rabbika. Uh, this is the calling to the way of your Lord, which is tawheed in Islam. So in order to share some information about tawheed, of course, by default, one must know about tawheed. And that cannot be stressed enough that tawheed must be firmly rooted in every single Muslim, but every single Muslim who wants to do da'wah must have a clear grasp on the rulings of Tawheed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to his uluhiyyah, his rububiyyah, and al asma wal sifat, his uh, lordship, his uh, uh, godship, meaning his right to be the ilah, the only ilah, and the only ilah that is worshipped, and his names and attributes. But look for the opportunities to share this message in your daily lives, whether it be you encounter someone on, on a regular basis, you introduce them that, you know, that, that, that Islam is the solution to the problems facing the modern world, which it is. We have no doubt about this. This is an issue of certainty for us, that Islam is the solution to the modern world's issues and problems. But we as Muslims need to have some care and concern for the modern world. We don't need to just sit back and watch it burn, or even worse, wish it to burn and be a part of those who help it burn. We need to be a part of the solution. And we need to be offering realistic, 
holistic solutions to the problems of the world. For far too long, as I finish in my last four minutes, our da'wah has been completely ideological, which is fine. Ideological da'wah, convincing people mentally that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and that he deserves to be worshipped. MashaAllah. But what can Islam do for that person? This has always been my question and trying to give da'wah to people is let me show you what Islam can do for you. And I know what it can do for you because I was once a non-Muslim who was on the brink of destruction in my life, the brink of nonsense, the brink of insanity, the brink of all kinds of uh, crime and pestilence. And Islam saved me. Alhamdulillah, it changed me into being the person I am today, which I'm not a great person, but I am, I am, I'm a much different person than I was at the age of 17. Let me tell you that. Um, and at least now I wake up every morning knowing my person, knowing my purpose, knowing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, knowing who my Rabb is, knowing who to worship. That is how Islam can save someone. It can give them purpose and definition in their life. It can change them. That is what we need to be offering to humanity before the boat drowns, before the the destruction comes, before the, the, the sky cracks, before the, the stars fall, before the oceans boil, before the day of judgment. We need to try within our capacity as human beings, as Muslims who believe in La ilaha illallah, to share that message with as many people as we are humanly capable of doing so. And in by doing that and having the intention to do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for not only obeying his verse, but he will reward you for following in the true path of the Anbiya. Because for sure, the one true path of all the Anbiya that they shared, beyond most of them were shepherds and they had other things that were in common with them, uh, but the one true commonality, the one true thread between all of the Anbiya was their da'wah to la ilaha illallah. They're calling humanity to tawheed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the legacy of all of the Anbiya. That is the legacy of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest human being to ever walk the face of this earth. And that should become and remain the legacy of this modern ummah as it was the legacy of the time of the companions. I thank you very much for your time and hopefully anything I have said has been beneficial in some way. May Allah bless you all. This is your brother Yusha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair brother Yusha. And inshallah we will after that uh, uh, stay with us. Uh, we will have a Q&A. And sister Wendy Diaz also I ask you to stay with us inshallah. And uh, uh, before I invite uh, our uh, next speaker. Uh, again, the reminder is that uh, please uh, support uh, ikna.org slash donate and also join us with, with us uh, and do the work of Dawa, which is uh, ikna.org slash baraka. So my next speaker is, I think everybody knows, he is a great <laughs> imam. Uh, he is a popular, we call him uh, Imam of America. So we know the why he would call him Imam of America. Well, let's uh, uh, Imam Siraj Bahad is a currently Imam of Masjid at Taqwa. Everybody knows it's a popular place in the Brooklyn, New York. Accepted Islam in 1969. He received the Imam training at Umm Al Qura University of Makkah in 1978. Wow. Imam Bahad was the first person to give an Islamic invocation to the United States Congress. Imam Saraj Bahad is also known as Imam, Imam of America. That's the whole thing. Imam Saraj Bahad. Alhamdulillah. Shadu wa la ilaha illallah wa shadu la sharika la shadu anna Muhammad jana abduhu wa rasul amabad. I want to thank all of our, our speakers. So you should know one of my favorite people in the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless my sister. I want to thank uh, Allah uh, for Ikna and having convening this this conference and all the great work that they do um i want to speak to you for a couple of minutes you know i have a i have a lot to talk about so feel free brother you know to stop me you may have to you, you may have to stop me because i <laughs> have a lot to, to speak about inshallah you know someone once said that the most important knowledge that you can have is the knowledge of yourself and I do think that the knowledge of yourself is critical. We should know who we are. The Quran talks about who we are as human beings. Uh, the Hadith talks about that. But I 
would argue that the most important knowledge we can ever have is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am amazed the more I study the Quran, the more I study to, to, to traditions of our Prophet Muhammad alayhi salat wa salam, the more I'm amazed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now I understand Allah haqqa qadrihi. They have not, you know, made a true estimate in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is incredible. I, I ran out, out of adjectives to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The thing that I want to talk about um, um, this evening is based upon an ayah from the Quran. On Yom Al Qiyamah, it will be said to us, Ikra Kitabaka. Read your record, read your book. Almost every week, wherever I go in the country, outside of the country, people ask me, Imam Siraj, when are you going to write your autobiography? Imam Siraj, when are you going to write your life story? In a real sense, I am writing my story. All of us are writing our story, and we may have some idea what will be in our book that we're writing right now. One of the books that I recommend, by the way, is the autobiography of Malcolm X. I strongly recommend that that, that we read it. But right now we're reading our, our autobiography. One thing I have discovered in the Quran, and obviously I'm not the only one that, has, has, that have discovered it, <clears throat> and in Hadith, is what the Arabs called Jumla Tur Shartiyya. Jumla Shartiyya. And that's conditional sentences. And almost it seems like an infinite number of verses and an infinite number of hadith. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but is filled with replete with conditional sentences. Let me give you uh, one idea. And in the course of my, my speech, I may give about five or six of these conditional sentences. Yeah, ayyuhaladina aminu in tensurullah. Oh, you who believe, if you help Allah, Allah will help you and make firm your feet. Of course, Allah don't need our help, but it's implying that if we help in the cause of Allah, as you should have said and the sister said, a da'wah. Um, if you help Allah, Allah will help you. So you will see all throughout the Quran all of these conditional sentences and hadith getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let me give you another a couple of ones Allah mentioned Quran Fathkuruni Athkurkum remember me and I remember you everyone is always asking the question what's in it for me why should I be Muslim why should I make salat why should I fast in the month of Ramadan why should I make pilgrimage? Why should I spend my money and make pilgrimage to Mecca? Why should I go to the masjid? Why should I pray five times a day? Why should I do all of this? And two things you have to learn about Allah. Number one, you cannot benefit Him. Nothing that we do. Seven billion, eight hundred million people praying to Allah every day, five times a day or 50 times a day will not benefit Him at all. And number two, you can't harm Allah, can't hurt him. You don't take away from his kingdom. You don't add to his kingdom. But we do it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything we do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes a notation of it. For man ya'mal mithqala dharat and khayran yura, whoever even does an atom's weight worth of good shall see it. Or an atom's weight, weight of evil shall see it. Conditional sentences. Aisha radiallahu anha said, which to me is amazing, if Allah mentioned Quran, Fathkuruni Athkurkum, remember me and I remember you, there's a hadith uh, that says that if you think about Allah, remember Allah in company, you mention Allah to other people, like we mention Allah now, Allah will mention you in a company better than your company, meaning the angels. If you think about Allah to yourself, how often we do dhikr, we by ourselves, we're in our homes, we're in our car, we're on the beach, we're in the forest, we're in the woods, we're in the masjid, and we think about Allah, 
And if you think about Allah to yourself, Allah will think about you to himself. You can't, you can't imagine. All these people at the same time, Allah knows exactly what we are doing, what we are thinking, what we are saying, what we are doing. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يذكر الله على كل أحيان. The Messenger of Allah remembered the law in every circumstance. All you have to do is get a hadith literature, and you see the Prophet is always remembering Allah when he eat, when he finish eating, before he eats, when he put his clothes on, when he take his clothes off. He's always remembering Allah subhanahu wa taala. That must mean that Allah is always remembering him. Let me give you um, something that I discovered maybe 25, 30 years ago. It's a hadith, a jumatul sharti, a conditional hadith. And there's plenty of them. And um, ever since I learned it, I've been making this, this uh, dhikra every day. Every day for the last maybe 30 years. And listen to what the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Men kala la ilaha illallah. Whoever says there's no God but Allah, la sharika la. He has no partners. Wallahul muk. And his is the kingdom. Wahu ala kuli shayin kadir. And he has power over all things. Whoever does that, who says that 100 times in one day. What's in it for me? Let me tell you what the Prophet said. Alayhi salat wa salam. He said, Allah will write down for you 100 good deeds will take away from you, erase from you, 100 bad deeds. Will give you the equivalent of, of setting 10 slaves free. And will protect you from shaitan until the evening. What? All of that from saying that? When I learned that 25, 30 years ago, I say it every day. Why wouldn't you say it? You see, all throughout the Quran and the Hadith is this Jumatul Shartiya, this is conditional sentence. You know, some people, when they say the Prophet, they don't want to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's encouraging us to say Sallallahu peace and blessing be upon him. And listen to what he said. Men Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi Biha, Ashrin. Whoever says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on me, Allah will uh, give uh, um, praise or, or um Thankfulness to him uh, 10 times because you can't outdo Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about other people? The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, He says, Allah will help his slave to the degree that his slave helps his brother. So, what am I saying, brothers and sisters? Let me leave you with my, my major point. Right now, the people are suffering. COVID-19, people losing their jobs, people losing their homes, their apartments, people hungry. I cried the other day we were raising money for Gaza when I learned about some of the tragedies in Gaza. I said, you know what? We have to do something. We have to do something about all the people that are suffering. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I drove from New York City to Atlanta, Georgia. It's about 900 miles. And right when I was beginning uh, my, my trip in the car, I noticed before I got on the um, highway, there was a man with two prosthetic uh, legs. And he was asking people for money. I called him over to me and gave him $20. $20 is not going to hurt me, but that $20 will do a lot for him. He was so grateful, so thankful. I didn't ask him his religion. I didn't ask him, you know, were you even religious or what book did you read? Because this is something in the in the human in the human soul. And I learned this about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot even begin to imagine um his his generosity. And I'm gonna bring two witnesses and then I'm gonna finish. About how much time do I have? Let me know how much time about. You you can't hear me? All right. 
How much time I have, Shay? Five, Five minutes. Okay, good. Let me let me try to um let me try to bring it to a conclusion. One of the um, principles of Islam is belief in Yom al Yom al Qiyamah. You, it's it's everything. It's it's uh, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, "Allahumma la Aisha illa Aisha al Akhirah." There's no life except the life of the hereafter. We don't know about this. I don't care how smart you are, how many universities you went to, how many degrees you have, you won't know about the hereafter unless the Prophet والسلام, unless Allah mentions it himself in his scripture. And every prophet talked about Yom al Qiyamah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he makes some, some promises. I'd like to bring to you two witnesses. Uh, number one, you know, all hellfire is not the same. According to the Quran, the monafic, the hypocrite, will be in the lowest of the hellfire, more worse than a kafir. So anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yom al-Qiyamah will go to the person least punished in the hellfire. All the hell is not the same. He'll go to the person least punished and ask that person, if you were given everything in the earth, would you ransom that to free yourself from this of course he says yes but you're not going to know about that until yom al qiyamah but when yom al qiyamah come people are going to see the next one i want to bring is a shaheed a martyr a person gave his life you, you what what more than that and the prophet peace and blessing be upon him said no one who dies and go to Jannah but want to come back to the earth even though he's given everything in it. Illa shaheed, except a shaheed, a martyr. A martyr will come back. Why? Because he want to be slain. He want to be killed. He want to be murdered ten more times in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the great honor that Allah has given to him. What am I saying? Brothers and sisters, you got to be firm in your faith. Promise is based on two things. Number one is based on integrity. Are you honest? Are you truthful? And number two is based on ability. Let me tell you something. I laughed. I told my wife this morning. I laughed. I was listening to a speech of Donald Trump this morning. He's speaking to his, his supporters. And he said, yes, I'm going to create 9 million jobs for black people. I said, really? Yes, and I'm going to create 500,000 businesses for black people. And I'm going to give them access to all of this money. And I laughed because I know politicians. You know the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. I'm almost finished. The sign of a hypocrite is three. When they talk, they lie. According to what the um, Washington Post, they say that the president, since he took office, have told more than 20,000 lies and misrepresentation. When they promise, they break their promise. Many politicians, they get in office, they make these promises and nothing. And when they are entrusted, they violate the trust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the law, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keeps his promise. Always. Does he have the ability to raise us up? You bet. So brothers and sisters, what am I saying today? Do all of this good deeds for yourself, for this life, and for the hereafter. Help your brothers and sisters. Help the people. Help the people that are suffering. These people in the United States and the rest of the world are suffering. Then let the Muslims do it. Because it's the right thing to do. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah khair, Siraj Bahad. Amazing inspiration. <clears throat> and uh, now we will have a QA. and a And uh, like uh, all the panels. And, uh, and uh, go with the... Uh, we received some questions, I think, uh, from audience. And some uh, are actually... Uh, one of the questions, I think, from... Uh, um, Mr. Diaz, uh, 
Maybe uh, uh, Latinos accept Islam nowadays, actually, especially after 911, and also from recently, uh, 2009, especially. Uh, one of your statistics was telling that uh, the, there is a, a rise in the uh, growth in the Latino. So, what could be the main cause or reason uh, for that? Is this uh, uh, they are reminded to their past uh, glory or history in Spain? And they came to know about what's uh, is this a bad impact, or they're really learning Islam and they're finding the difference between Catholic uh, uh, faith and the. And on the other hand, there is other also added question to that: that the Protestant uh, Christian, as compared to Catholic, the Protestants are not many entering into Islam as compared to Catholics. So, any other idea about that also? So we know um, statistically that Latino Muslims are growing um, since 2000. Um, in 2019, I have here some statistics. Only 1% of Muslims identified as Hispanic. By 2018, that number had reached 7%. Wow. So Muslims identifying as Hispanic or Latino. Uh, and so that's about a 700% increase over 10 years. The reason for that, alhamdulillah, I think there's there are reasons. Uh, we are living together in uh, in communities where there is Latino and Muslim presence. So there's, there's that interconnection happening there in different places. And that is uh, in the dawah efforts, even if it's indirect dawah, right? Just through example, a lot of people are learning about Islam and coming coming to Islam from that angle. On, on, on the other hand, also, if you look, I mean, in 2000, over 10 years, 2000 to 2018, sorry, 2008 to 2018, you see a growth, but there's also been a growth in technology. There's been a shift in technology. So now we, we live in this uh, globalized uh, internet community where information is so easily accessible. So we have a lot of Hispanics who are also going back to their roots. For example, one example, a lot of, uh, one of the things that is popular now is the ancestry test. You have like ancestry DNA, uh, 23 and me, and people are taking these DNA tests and come to find out, lo and behold, I was in a forum where there was a young man from Puerto Rico who said, I took this ancestry test and he's a non-Muslim. And he said, and for some reason it came back that I'm 90% Arab. How is this possible? I was born in Puerto Rico. My parents were born here. How can this be? And so he came to find out that he has this ancestry he didn't know about. So that's another way. There are so many different things happening now that this information is out there. And uh, we just need to continue to expand those efforts. As far as the spiritual reasons why Latinos are coming into Islam, we have a lot of similarities in our belief system, and a lot of Latinos are disenchanted with Catholicism because of different reasons. Uh, one of them is the, the belief in, in the one God, but then also the Trinity. So there's like some contradictions in the belief system. Uh, a lot of Latinos like myself, I went from Catholicism to Protestantism, trying to find answers to the questions that I had about theology, and then eventually found my way to Islam. So it was that type of process. Um, I think either either way, Latinos are finding that there are too many contradictions and there are not enough things being put into practice in the Christian faith, in the Christian church, and that's why they are turning to Islam. And a lot of the best, and that those are just some some small reasons, and there are many, many other reasons as well. Uh, uh, one more question, actually, from you. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, Latinos uh, they ask for the Quran, and uh, they always confuse with the translations uh, in Spanish. You know, and they get confused which one is the best. And some Muslim scholar they also criticize some of those translations. Which one is you recommend? Or currently, you, you find yourself as a very uh, felt comfortable to uh, so there are several translations in Spanish and I'm going to pull this one out here. Um, the one I work for YSM and the one that we have been distributing is the, the newest one, which is in Latin American Spanish. And this is Muhammad Isa Garcia, Isa Garcia's translation, um, El Coran. 
And um, this is printed in several several places. One of them is Furkan Foundation. I believe they print it. So you can go to their website and you can order through them. You can order through us as well, ysm.org uh, slash bazaar. So you can find it there. Um, Isa Garcia's translation is more in line with the Latin American Spanish. Uh, whereas other translations, for example, the one with the red cover, which is uh, Abdul Melara Navio, that one is more Spanish from Spain. So some of the wording is different. Some of the, the usage of the language is different. So I do recommend this one, Isa Garcia translation. Traducida uh, 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 al And uh, one question is from Siraj Wahad. Uh, person asks, Yes, you, sir. If you, among the 99 names of Allah, which names actually you prefer? And uh, if you are given the alignment to, like, as salam ar rahim you know you know I have that. You know Listen, you know that's a crazy question, right? So it's, <laughs> you can't answer all of it, right? But let me say this though, in honor of one of my teachers, 1978, you mentioned, I was I went to Umu Quraya University in Mecca, and one of my of my teachers, um, Sheikh Hussein Hamid Hassan, rahimallah, he just died uh, about three weeks ago, and he's a real a real alum, and I'm going to say the two two uh, attributes that he used every day. He started his class. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana inna ka antal alimul al hakim. You are the knowing and the wise. And there are a lot of Muslims and a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge, but few have wisdom. So we have to learn wisdom uh, from Sister uh, Wendy and Yusra really have taught us um, uh, the meaning really of, of, of wisdom. Beyond this knowledge, we want to use wisdom. So listen, I'm not going to be caught out there with this. <laughs> Masha'Allah, Al Alim and Al Hakim. That's yes. probably I can figure out now. So I think that's you answered the question actually. And uh, brother uh, Yusha, we always love you. Uh, your Dawai for you coming here in LA and giving us uh, lectures and resolve all those uh, tough Dawa questions and for us. And um, we uh, recently actually. Um, uh, Sometimes uh, people engage in dawah, especially a lot of uh, uh, Christians uh, when we go to dawah booth. They always debate on this uh, Bible versus the Quran or some. Uh, and uh, sometimes the, we talk about the Bible is corrupt or something, and sometimes they get uh, offended with that, and then they don't communicate with us. What the best approach of, uh, should we bring the scripture in the discussion first, or how you initiate? that actually so now uh, this is a good question actually uh, before before that I want to say to Khair and sister Wendy uh, for her time uh, and her eloquent speech I want to say to Khair to Imam Saraj and I miss you man and it's been far too long since we've come across each other we know we know each other since way 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 back the Zakudi right. Trophy days way way back um, and and uh, brother Muhammad Hussein, you know, I I, I lived in LA for like a year, uh, but there was two things that, that drove me out of California. Number one, there's too many people, and number one, it costs too much money. Um, so, when it comes to giving da'wah to Christians using the Bible, I don't recommend this for most people, and I've been saying this for a very long time, and I've never really agreed with this. Now, I I know that. So I don't want to try to be too long-winded, but I know a lot of this started with the, the following of Sheikh Ahmed Didad, rahimahullah ta'ala. Um, but you have to understand that Ahmed Didad's intention was never, he never woke up one day and said, you know what, I'm going out into the streets with the Bible and I'm going to, you know, stump all these Christians. His da'wah was defensive. He was being onslaught by missionaries in South Africa with the Bible. So he had to use what was being used against him. Um, and he became very good at it, but that's not that's not everybody's situation. Um, I use the Bible uh, frequently because of the simple fact that's how I was born and raised. I understand that book because the problem with with uh, Christian Muslim dialogue 
And this is the reason I always suggest born and raised Muslims to stick the, to, to stick to the Quran. We have the perfect word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let that speak for itself and be what it is. But for someone like myself, I not only understand Christianity from a textual perspective, I understand it from a psychological perspective. I know how Christians think, what what how they feel about their Bible, how they feel about certain verses. Why? Because I was raised feeling that way about those verses. I was raised thinking like that. So it gives me a bit of an advantage in, in, in that arena, um, as you would. And I spent time studying the Bible before becoming a Muslim as a youth. So I use it because it's something I believe I can, if, if I have a, a deep enough conversation with someone, can get them to some understanding. But for your average born and raised Muslim to try to debate a Christian using the Bible, you're going to lose with anyone who knows the Bible half well. You're going to lose because it is a a, a, a a mirage in the desert. Every time you think you've got it, there's another verse that's going to throw it all the way in left field because it contradicts itself left, right, and center. So don't 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 go there. You know, if a Christian comes to you and tries to show you verse of the Bible where the Bible says this, my common response is which Bible? Is you are you are you talking about the King James Bible, the New Reverse Standard Version Bible? You're talking about the you know the Catholic Bible, the Bible, because they're every single one of them is different. As Muslims, we use the Quran because it is the perfect word of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and we can trace its origin back to the original manuscripts and the original source, who is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who taught it to us by Allah. Stick with that. What the Christians have is very weak. It is weak. And when you put the Quran against it, the two look immeasurably uh, different. But if you keep trying to argue Bible with Bible, that's not really going to get you very far because you're arguing, you're arguing something bad with something bad. It's just not going to work. Stick with the Quran. It has everything it needs. I read the Quran once as a non-Muslim and I accepted Islam. That's all it took for me. So it has always been for me, the Quran that has been the source of guidance for mankind. Stick with that. Don't go into the Bible realm if that's not what the person wants to discuss. And if they want to bring up a Bible verse, say, hey, look, I don't I don't know much about the Bible. I don't know much about its history. It has a very, you know, a very colorful history to say the least, but we have the Quran, which is the unadulterated, uncorrupted word of God directly from God's mouth, uh, excuse me, Allah, directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you use that instead of going with the Bible. Sorry that was long-winded, but that's quite important in Dawah because I see too many people trying to become Bible thumpers and, and it doesn't work. Jazakallah khair for all of you, the beautiful uh, topics and good Q&A. Uh, my next speaker will be uh, or the president of the Islamic Circle of North America. So we will end here, inshallah. And uh, um, um, again, Jazakallah khair. And uh, um, <clears throat> Javed Siddiqui is the president of Islamic Circle of North America. Javed is a member of the National Sura, Shura, and he is the current program chair for in uh, ICNA Annual Convention. An engineer by profession, Javed holds master's degree in electrical engineering. I present you President of Islamic Circle of North America, Java Siddiqui. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Zakumla, brother uh, Muhammad Hussain, for the introduction. And uh, before I know, uh, hopefully, uh, Imam Sinaj and uh, Sheikh Evans and Sister Windy are watching, I've truly enjoyed your session. Imam Siraj and all of you, Allah, I, I, I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, every time, I've watched your sessions. Uh, it's been an inspiration. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah accept uh, your efforts. Brothers and sisters, we're very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and very humble that he is using us to really expand this prophetic mission of prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It really humbles us all as an organization, as an individual, as a jama'ah that we are able to contribute and we're able to bring to the attention we are able to preach this beautiful way of life so i can't 
say th enough thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> this conference, uh, this first of its kind virtual global conference, I say that for a reason because not only we have been able to this time bring all the different orgs, embra uh, embrace, why Islam, gain peace. These are the ICNA projects, but in, in addition to that, other organizations and other, other da'wah uh, arms from all around the world, from, uh, you know, from the UK, from uh, Japan, from New Zealand, from uh, Australia, Latin America, Canada, all these countries. I mean, we have, alhamdulillah, been able to bring all of them. And inshallah, this will prove to be a, a step in a new direction to be able to start this global effort to bring awareness to Islam, to bring awareness to solutions that this beautiful way of life really provides us. Uh, we see the world around us uh, really confused. And I think as Muslims, we are so fortunate, so fortunate that we have the solutions, we have the way, the beautiful way of life that allows us to have that peace and tranquility, even in this time of confusion. Brothers and sisters, over the this past weekend here, alhamdulillah, for the last, uh, you know, I was looking at uh, some of the stats. Uh, there's been about 17 hours of programming, and we've had almost 37 speakers from around the world who spoke to uh, a global audience. So it's it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to change minds and hearts of people around the world, and. Uh, <clears throat> We saw presentations and regarding interfaith, the interfaith conversations that we are having. We we saw presentations when it comes to um, our brothers and sisters. In fact, when I was listening to uh, uh, you know Imam uh, Ahmed from from Japan, and he was pr providing a perspective, which was really amazing. And when he started saying, uh, I think uh, Brother Eddie asked him about question about. Uh, uh, about Islam and how people of Japan were were thinking about Islam. He said something was very interesting. Even before 9-11, uh, Japanese uh, society was looking at Islam and questioned a lot of things. And then he gave the reason for that. And that was that the Iraq and Iran war, which uh, the people of Japan looked at and said, why are people from the same faith fighting each, each, each other? And that calls to our attention as, as Muslims all over the world, that everything that we do, we may not recognize the fact that we are ambassadors of Islam. When we say, when a sister is wearing hijab, when, when a brother is uh, you know, in, his, in his garment and he's, he looks like a Muslim, he may not think uh, much about it, but th at the end of the day, he's representing Islam. Whatever our actions are, brothers and sisters, we are representatives of Islam. We are the ambassadors of Islam. So it's amazing when you hear perspectives from around the world. Brother Hamza, Zor to say, I mean, every time I, I listen to his, uh, his presentations, it's really amazing the kind of authority, the kind of confidence, and the kind of knowledge he brings to the table when it comes to issues of atheism. Every single speaker that, that we heard over the last couple of days really brought about a perspective that we couldn't have learned on our own. Many a times, they, it's, it's really an effort after years and years of you know, getting into that topic. And that has been brought to us, alhamdulillah, in the comforts of our home. So we must be very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and should try to look at ways in which how can I, as a human being, how can I, as a believer, really contribute towards this, this amazing work this amazing prophetic mission of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I, I spoke about it yesterday, and I think many of our speakers uh, throughout the, the last couple of days here spoke about this responsibility of da'wah, this responsibility of bringing this beautiful way of life, this responsibility, this uh, concept of oneness of Allah, how that is so integral and I think Imam Siraj in his last, uh, in, in the last presentation, he says something very profound. He said, one of the most important knowledge is the knowledge about, of Allah. 
you know, people say about them, it's very important to know yourself, but even more important, the most important thing for a person is to know his creator. Who created me? Who put me here? What is my mission? What am I doing here? All those answers. I can provide a piece of bread for, to, a, to a person and I can provide a piece of, uh, you know, a meal to a person and I may be able to take care of him for that one hour or two hours. Or I can even provide financial assistance and uh, a shelter and food to somebody and I can make someone's life comfortable. But that is, that is temporary. That is temporary, brothers and sisters. But when I provide guidance to someone and the ability to understand their creator, I'm acting upon the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi where he says, إِنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرِ النَّعْمِ If Allah were to guide through you a, a single person, then it's much better than you, better for you than the red she camels, which was one of the most expensive commodities. In other words, it's better for you than the riches of the world. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> Uh, this environment of COVID has really forced us in ways that we could ha not have anticipated. It has forced us to reimagine the work of Dawah. And inshallah, <clears throat> we look forward to everyone who's listening today, everyone who spent the last couple of days with us in this conference. We're really looking forward to you to reach out to us ikna.org slash baraka, ikna.org slash donate, ikna.org, you know where to go. You know how to find us. I re really invite you. We want you to be a partner in our effort. We want you to become our arms and our ears and our eyes everywhere. We really want your time, the resources you can provide us. If you are, if you are an expert on social media, we love to hear from you. If you can help us with digital designs, we would love to hear from you. If you can help volunteer at our booths, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to be part of these road trips that we make and uh, uh, you know, Sheikh Hijazi was talking about, we would love to really hear from you. Be a partner in this campaign, brothers and sisters. Be a partner in this campaign to reach out to every single household in America. Brothers and sisters, let's do it before the time is up. Let's try to do whatever we can, whatever we can. And everything that you and I can do, inshallah, will be recorded in the Book of Deeds, inshallah. And on the day that we will need this, the, 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 one, of the, one of the speakers presented such a beautiful way. He said, you know, the brother who invited me to become a Muslim, he would be benefiting from my, from whatever, even my son who is a hafiz now and who will for generations, inshallah, will continue to benefit mankind with his knowledge of Quran, with his hifth of Quran. That, that brother who gave him or invited him to Islam will continue to benefit from that, from the entire family's impact. I mean, there is no such pyramid scheme ever on the day of judgment which there are so many hadith a person would come and will find a mountain an entire valley worth of gold and silver and so so many different hadith that point to this this fact that on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would present him about his good deeds and he'll say when did I do these deeds and then he'll be told this was the impact of this and this and this and this and this all the acts of Sadaqah Jariya, all the acts that, because, because the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises believers that he will continue to pay them. He will, con they will continue to be, you know, taking it, they'll be able to take advantage of and they'll be rewarded. The same reward as the person, the person who is calling other people to good deeds, as is the as the person who is actually doing it so many examples and we don't have the time and i think my time is running out here so 
in conclusion brothers and sisters we want you to join us we want you to join us in this this cause to call humanity to the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we want you to be our partner join us with your with your time with your skills with your resources support these projects financially really if you can do it and you know other people who can do it please reach out to them let them know that ikna is interested in you we want you to be part of this journey and inshallah i hope and pray this <clears throat> this conference have really sparked uh, you know a ray of hope in you in terms of what is what is coming next i think if we all of us together bring our resources bring our imagination bring our ideas together we can change this world brothers and sisters and at the same time just remember this it's all about the effort it's all about what you and i will do this is a blessing of this religion that we are not required we are not responsible for the results unlike any other system in this on this world in this world we are judged by results but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges it by efforts if you wake up one day and you have the urge and you have the thought process and you have and you want to do something and you do something about it regardless of what the results are allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that Let's join hands, brothers and sisters, to call people to us Allah. Let's join hands while we have the ability, while we have the strength, the health, and the resources to be able to do that. I thank you, all of you, for joining us for this memorable first virtual conference. And inshallah ta'ala, I uh, hope and pray that you found this to be beneficial. I hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would allow us to be part of this prophetic mission. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.